What happens when Jesus heads into Jerusalem? That's what we're going to find out in Matthew 21. Well, here we are. We are headed towards Jerusalem. And this means the most impactful thing that Jesus is going to do in his ministry, the act that everyone has been trying to stop him from doing is coming soon. So he starts off in Bethphage, which is in the Mount of Olives. So across this Kidron Valley, there's the Mount of Olives. And again, it's what I kept calling the Olive Garden in the other podcast. I didn't mean to do that, but it is. It's a grove of olives and it's a very peaceful, nice place. The Church of All Nations is over there now. And so he tells them to go to Bethany, which is about two miles from Jerusalem proper, and you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her, with the donkey. Go bring them to me. And if anyone stops you, you're going to say, hey, Lord needs them, and then he will let you have them at once. And exactly what happened, happened. And this is to fulfill prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. And he quotes, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a beast of burden. These are working animals. These are not a majestic horse that is found in a chariot that a Roman emperor would walk in on. These are working people, humble modes of transportation. So the disciples brought the donkey and the colt, the colt being the young donkey, not a horse, which, which is what I was thinking. They put the cloaks on them and Jesus sat on them. Most of the crowd then went ahead of Jesus, putting their own cloaks on the ground and branches from the tree. So here we are, Palm Sunday. If you are a Christian, you go to church. This is where we do palms and have a palm-based cross as a remembrance of Palm Sunday. But they spread these items on the ground. And in the culture at the time, you did this for a triumphant king. This is marking the success of a victor and normally the king or the leader of the people. And the crowd went before him shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosea and the highest. And Hosanna means save us. And it is like a scream to save us. Hosanna. The whole city, it says, was stirred up. This is an ESV. Who is this? Israel's not that big of a place. And so the word gets around. And so when he goes there, people were either confused about who he was, but then they remembered, oh, that's the story we've been hearing about the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So Jesus went into the temple and drove out those who sold and bought in the temple area, the money changers, the people who sold animals and pigeons, and said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And that is from Isaiah 56, 7. So he is telling them, you are taking something beautiful like the temple, this thing to worship God and turning it into this cheesy, gaudy market where you're ripping people off. You're, you're literally stealing for people. The reason would be is that, first of all, no one there could be there unless the people who were running the temple allowed it. So you're supposed to come to the temple with offerings to God, the temple tax, you know, rich people would give a perfect lamb, that image to Jesus, and other people who were poor did doves, you know, cheap birds that they could get from anywhere. And so when you went to this area, you could take a big coin and turn it into a little coin so that perhaps you can go then and buy a dove or to pay the temple tax or to take foreign coins and bring it into a value of a shekel. Money changers had a lot of different roles that they charged money for. Reminds me of those dudes at the airport who will give you any currency you want and charge you a lot for it too. You've turned this into, makes me think of like Disney World, you've turned this into an obnoxious market. And that is not what the temple was supposed to be about. And probably the people who ran the temple, which would be the Sadducees, Again, we talked about the Sanhedrin. I just did a podcast on Small Steps with God talking about the different occupations that were found at that time. Probably all got a cut of this money. So this was a pretty good and lucrative job. And then again, the blind and the lame came to Jesus in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw what he was doing and that children were crying out in the temple, they wanted to come to him. 
they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David, save us, son of David. Now they were mad. They were indignant. Do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus says, yeah. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise? Even the small children who do not understand the complexities of religion, Jesus saying they get it. They understand it and they are praising God, me. So he went out of the city and went back to Bethany and lodged there for the night, you know, to hang out for the night. And when Jesus came up in the morning, it says that he returned. He was hungry. He sees a fig tree and went to it and it only had leaves. Some people said that these particular types of figs, when they have leaves, they are producing fruit. They, they do that all the time. But this is going to be a lesson, not just about him wanting to eat figs. So he walks up to the fig tree and he says, may you never fruit again. And the fig tree withers instantaneously. Some people suggested that this was false advertising. If these types of figs always have fruit, whenever they have leaves, meaning they're blooming, they're in blooming season, and this one didn't, it's false advertising. But again, this is about a bigger lesson because he tells them, if you have faith and don't doubt, you can do what I did to this fig tree. You can say to the mountain, get up and throw yourselves into the sea. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Some people say the mountain refers to Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem's mountain. Some say it's the Mount of Olive. And some say that this refers to Revelation when the mountains will be thrown into the sea and that we should not be afraid. But I think to me, it means a big thing. He moved mountains to get there. This is something impossible seeming, yet through the power of prayer, it can happen. People take this to believe that you can get anything that you want. You can have anything that you want that you ask in faith, that you can claim it after praying it. But you have to realize that we've seen in the past God talk about prayer. God gives us what we need. He knows us as a father. In past chapters, what father would give his children stones when they should need bread or give them snakes when they want fish? He knows what's best for us. And so this isn't us trying to tempt him and say, okay, God, give me a boat and a cabin up north. That's not what's being requested here. But that faith will open your eyes and your heart to amazing things. It just may not be the thing you asked for. It used to be an old country song that, and the country singer said that he thanked God for unanswered prayers. God knows what's best for us. And we have to understand that. That sometimes the answer is no for what we pray about, but God will do miracles in our lives even if we don't get exactly what we think is the miracle. His will be done, not our will be done. But the story makes me think about why in this case he talks about the fig not producing fruit. We've seen the fruit before. Or the mountain jump into the sea. Does he mean the mountain that Jerusalem sits on? Is the fig that's not producing fruit the religious leaders of the temple? We have to look at it, too, as part of this story. He is yelling at the religious leaders for not leading the people of Israel to God, for not producing the harvest of the people of Israel and the people around them. They are for themselves. They're not for God. And the fig tree, the imagery of the fig tree tends to be about a fig that's not producing fruit. We heard John say it. We heard Jesus say it, that you can tell how good a plant is by what kind of fruit it produces. In this case, the fig looked good, had leaves, did its fig leaf thing, but it wasn't producing figs. A tree that doesn't produce fruit is not a good tree, even if it looks really good. And this is going to be an analogy of, is it the religious leaders not producing fruit? Is it the nation of Israel not producing fruit? I believe it's probably the temple leadership. And what did John say about trees that don't produce fruit? The axe is at the base. I want to point out, too, with the fig tree, some people talk about this being a continuation of Jesus' anger in the temple. Jesus wasn't angry at the fig tree. It just wasn't doing what it was created to do. It was not fulfilling its purpose. I think, likewise, then we have the den of robbers in the temple area, and he's saying, get out. I think this is the same thing. You look great. Probably the temple looked fantastic then, but it's not doing its purpose. It was not producing the fruit it was supposed to be. Instead, it was creating robbers in the temple area. So as Jesus crosses the two miles from Bethany back into Jerusalem, he enters the temple area and the chief priests and the elders again come up to him. 
What authority are you doing all of this? Who's behind you? Who's backing you? Because they've been told he's working from the point of view of the devil. He goes, I'll tell you, but answer me this. The baptism of John, where did it come from? Heaven or from man? Is he just making it up and doing rituals for the sake of mankind? And they were afraid to answer. I'm sure they had opinions about it because, again, they were standing in the audience watching John very carefully. And I didn't see a big uproar of them talking about John being killed. So they worried about the crowd because the crowd loved John. He had a lot of followers, a lot of people that felt he was another Old Testament prophet and he was coming, maybe as Elijah, to either be the Messiah or announce the Messiah. So they were afraid to answer. And so they talked about from themselves and they so they just started playing politics. Well, if we answer this way, the crowds are going to do this. And if we answer the other way, so they didn't know what to do. And he says, well, if you won't say it, I'm not going to tell you who I do those things by either. He knows their cowardice and the fact that they're not giving real answers to his questions. They are trying to make the crowd not be angry. So then he gives the parable of the two sons. So a man owns a vineyard and he tells his two sons, hey, go work in my vineyard. And the first son says, no, I'm not going to do that. And then he changes his mind and goes and works in the vineyard. And then the second son said, I go, sir. But then he didn't do it. Which of these two sons did the will of his father? It's the tax collectors, the prostitutes, you know, all the people that he preached to did the will of God, even though they said they weren't going to. And then John came to you all and you didn't believe him because the other people, the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And after you saw what John did, you didn't change your mind and believe in him. You had that opportunity. You were the son saying, I'm going to do God's will. And then you don't do God's will. Yet all these people who you call sinners, they did God's will, even though they said that they weren't going to live in a godly way. Then he gives the parable of what they call the tenant. Again, the chapter headings are kind of a summary of that. So a guy planted a vineyard, put a big fence around it, and dug a wine press. When I was on my dig in Ashkelon, I was digging out a wine press area, which was huge and it was super cool. A lot of vases and jars to put the wine in and built a tower and leased it to his tenants, went someplace else. So you go work this land, sell your proceeds, you know, while I'm gone, you'll work this farm. And so then the tenants took the manservant and beat them, killed another, stoned another. So then the landowner sent other servants and they did the same thing to him. So these people, these tenants he rented this land to are not respecting the people the landowner is sending. Finally, he sends his son. Of course, they're going to respect my son. You know, he's precious to me. They all know this. And when the tenant saw the son, they said, this is the heir. Let's kill him. Have his inheritance. And so they took him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And so he says that when the owner comes back, what is he going to do to all those tenants? And they said to him, well, they're going to put those wretches, you know, to death because they killed his own son and then rented the vineyard out to other tenants who will give them fruits of the season. They didn't want to work the land. They wanted to rent it out so they could live high off the proceeds without doing anything. And so when he left the land, he sent out his servants to work the land for the tenants that he leased out the land to. So the people answering him understood the justice of it. What the problem is, is they didn't see themselves in this, that essentially this land was given to a group of people. They were told to produce fruits and to have the proceeds. And every servant, prophet, that God sends out to this land, the prophets were killed, dishonored in their own land, rejected. And in that same way, now God is sending his son and his son will be killed and thrown out of the vineyard. They understood what this parable meant. A little bit like how David understood when the prophet told him a parable. He understood finally the sin he committed. This is what Jesus is telling them. He is convicting them of their sin and the sin that they're about to do in killing him by using a parable. And then he asked them, have you read the scripture, Psalm 118, where it says that the stone the builders rejected becomes the cornerstone? A cornerstone is what held up the entire building. It had to be the best stone. 
And instead, this stone was rejected as part of the building, and yet now it has become part of the cornerstone. You who are about to reject me, I am the cornerstone. I am the central structure of this building. And so he said then, the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you and given to a people producing fruit. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. So you're going to destroy this stone, this cornerstone. And if you do it, you will also be destroyed. You have to realize that in a very stone area like Israel is, stone analogies were well understood. And particularly in the town that Herod built. When you look at the stones that Herod put in place at the temple, in the arches he built, I was looking at a picture and I thought, this arch that I crossed under every day was magnificent. And I went to go look at it. And sure enough, Herod built that arch. People understood quality stone building. And so if he gives them a stone analogy about the cornerstone, the stone being thrown out, they understood that this is them rejecting the main center focus of this building, the most important part. And if you plot against Jesus, it, they're going to destroy themselves. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard of this parable, they said, wait, is he talking about us? Yeah, he's talking about you. And even though they were trying to arrest him, they still were afraid of the crowd because just like John, now they believe in Jesus to be a prophet. And what they're not seeing is that he is the cornerstone, not just a prophet. And that ends up Matthew 21. So this is a lot of parables and this is a longer chapter. So my meditation this week is what the Pharisees were doing when they were trying to hedge their bets and what they were going to say. Well, if we say this, it's going to happen like that. If we say the other thing, then the crowd gets mad. How many times when we speak to other people, do we hedge what we're trying to say because we're trying to say the politically correct thing? We're trying to say the thing that won't get us in trouble. And instead, we should be honest about what we're saying, truthful about what we're saying, because Playing politics with our words, particularly when it comes to talking about God, never is a good thing. My prayer this week is that I will always recognize my prayer this week has to do with purpose. The temple wasn't doing what it was created to do. The fig wasn't doing what it was created to do. I'm going to pray about that. What is it that is my purpose? And am I fulfilling what it is God created me to do? And then the thing I want to share is that message of producing good fruit, that we want to be the fruiting fig tree in the kingdom of heaven, not just something that's showy with pretty leaves, not something that is a farm that's built state of the art, and yet we just kill everyone who tries to work in the farm, but instead produce good fruit ourselves, but also enable those who are working in the kingdom's mission so that they can produce good fruits for us too. And I guess that's why I like doing this Bible study. We get the idea of the story of the figs, and we get the idea of the money robbers in the court of the temple, and we get the idea of the fig being showy but not producing fruit. But why did they come on the same day? Why did they happen in Jerusalem? I think studying the Bible in context shows us how the stories are related to each other. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. And please send me anything I can pray for you or any requests that you have, you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.